If my faithfulness wavers, if my behavior doesn't line up with Scripture, if I choose selfishness or pride, if I choose to lose my temper, if I do anything sinful, that does not dictate his commitment to me. He is already 100% committed. When I'm made made alive in Christ, I am 100% righteous, 100% forgiven. I have a 100% brand new identity. The old is gone. The new has come. And so his commitment to me does not waver. No matter how I behave, no matter how far I choose to run from him or how much I ignore him or how much I buy into what the sinful lifestyle has for me, his commitment to me does not change. And we weren't given this gift of freedom to sin all the more. We weren't given liberty so that we could test it to its extremes. But we were given it so that we could be free to choose where we want to go, what we want to be, who we want to be about. We have freedom. You can choose. The legalistic believer says, I'm going to earn this. And when I sin, when I screw up, before I talk to God or before I go back to church, I have to go over here and I have to clean myself up. I have to have a certain amount of days clean before I can go back among God's people. I have to make sure I've sorted out and covered all my, covered all my stories to make sure I have the right one before I go back into God's family, back into church. I have to clean myself up before I come back before God. And that's, you're putting too much faith in yourself. The prodigal son's story is all about this, that he betrayed his father, went away to a foreign land, partied until he was out of money, rehearsed the line that he was going to come back to his father and say, I'm sorry, please just let me be one of your hired hands. And when he came back, it says that his father, God in this story, the prodigal son who left and betrayed him is us in this story. When the prodigal son's walking back down the path, rehearsing his lines, his father sees him from a distance, sprints out to meet him, throws his arms around him, interrupts his explanation, and says, give him a ring, give him a robe, let's throw a party. My son was lost, and now he is found. We can run back to God. We don't have to go clean ourselves up first. He came from the mud where he was feeding pigs, and he walked home, and God the Father sprinted out to meet him, threw his arms around him. Let's have a party because what was lost, my son was lost, and now he is found. Right? That's the good news of grace. Legalism doesn't have any play in that. He didn't get through his legalistic, like, excuses and I'm sorry's and please take me back this way, God. The father interrupted it and said, let's throw a party. You're back. That's good news. That's the good news. So the first incorrect response to the gospel of grace is legalism. The second one is a lukewarm faith. Right? You respond in lukewarm or half-hearted commitment back to God. And God's commitment to you was not half-hearted, was it? It was crucifixion and torture, right? Perfect lifestyle lived before up to that point, sinless. Torture, crucifixion when he did not deserve it, and rising to new life. He was wholehearted in his commitment to you. And a half-hearted commitment or a lukewarm faith, that sort of response, a lukewarm believer is looking to be validated, to be justified in his behavior to say, I don't have to have all-out pursuit of God. I don't have to seek or obey or love God with all of my heart. Jesus is my homeboy, right? We're boys. He's cool with me. I'm cool with him. Everything's all right. It's chill. I know I'm going to heaven. You want to be a cool Christian? What Jesus says about the lukewarm believer is this. You are lukewarm. Again, this is Jesus speaking. You are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I'm rich, wealthy, have no need of anything, And do not know that you are actually wretched, miserable, blind, naked, poor. You you have to strike that balance there. I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I have no needs. Jesus is like, no, actually, you're miserable. You don't even know it. You're blind, you're naked, you're poor. You don't even realize it. You think you're rich and wealthy? A lukewarm believer doesn't want to cut things off of his life. Like, I'm still going to live with my girlfriend. I'm still going to go party here. I'm still going to choose to live this lifestyle. I'm not going to cut anything out. I'm going to continue to live the way I lived before I got saved because Jesus loves me, and I have freedom, and I have liberty, and I can do whatever I want because I have freedom. And they use their freedom as an excuse to go behave any which way they want. And Jesus is saying, you think you're rich and wealthy and free and happy? You don't even realize what you're missing out on. You're miserable. You don't even know it. You're so afraid to change anything in your life and cut anything off of your life, you don't realize the pure gold that I have available to you. It's like you're playing in a mud puddle, pumped on it, 
and your parents are trying to get you inside, like, come on, let's go to Disney, let's get you cleaned up. Like, no, mom, I'm good, look at this mud. It's freezing cold, you're cold, you're naked. You have so much mud in your eyes you can't see. I'm trying to take you to Disney, let's go. You're like, no, I love mud. <laughs> it's like, you don't even realize what you're missing out on. The lukewarm faith, the half-hearted commitment to Jesus saying, yeah, I'm saved, I believe in God. That's where I existed before I got saved, forever. Yeah, I believe in God, yeah, I'm in. I believe in Jesus, yeah, God, all those things, I believe in him. I don't want to talk about it, but I believe in it. And it's like, it's like a, being a homeless man that lives under a bridge. Right? You're a homeless man living under a bridge, and you come into an inheritance, millions of dollars. You just find out that one of your long-lost family members left you a huge inheritance. There's a whole family waiting for you, a whole inheritance waiting for you. You have the opportunity to buy homes, to start your own businesses, to pour into the people that you love, the people that you've interacted with in your homelessness. You can go love on them and take care of them. You have all these opportunities available to you, and you're like, I'll go pick it up tomorrow. I'm going to just chill under the bridge for a little bit longer. I'm all right here. I'm, I got it. It's there. I know it's there. I know I have a whole family that wants to love on me and walk me into what it means to have all this money, to have all these, this favor, this blessing in my life. But I'm kind of chill under my bridge right now. I'm going to stay right here. You have an inheritance waiting for you. And a lukewarm believer doesn't understand that, man, a couple changes in your life, you can follow Jesus sincerely, and he will open you up to what you were created for. To worship and to glorify, to follow, and to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what your creation purpose is. You're most in line with who you naturally are when you are doing those things. A lukewarm believer doesn't even understand how much they're missing out on. The third response, incorrect response to the gospel that we talked about last week was the confused believer. And these are sincere people who have sincerely committed themselves to Jesus, right? I sincerely have been changed. I need Jesus in my life. I love you. I'm in for you, Jesus. But they're confused because they haven't built a foundation on the truth of Scripture. They're confused because they haven't had anybody, a spiritual mother or father, pouring into them, discipling them, and showing them what this lifestyle is about. And every trendy jo doctrine that comes across their face, like, I like how that guy communicated that thing. But then the next better communicator, completely opposite idea, they'll say, no, I, yeah, I like that. I like how he communicated that. I agree with him now. Oh, I agree with this guy now. And we're tossed to and fro, back and forth by the waves and the winds of doctrine. It's literally what the scripture says in Ephesians 4. He says, we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine or by the trickery of men, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up to maturity. One of these three things, you're going to naturally feel like, yeah, I can see myself drifting that way. I can see myself drifting that way. I have the tendency to fall into the legalistic side. I'm more lukewarm with the way I behave. I've kind of just fallen into confusion and haven't really pursued the truth and what God has available to me. I'm begging you, if you're a confused believer, please get discipled. It works way better than if you have any confusion that you go seek out someone to disciple you. It works so much better. From experience, I've, I've gone after, hey, let's do this, let's do this, let me come with me, I'll, let me pursue you, let me disciple you, let me pour into you. And guys like, yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome, I'd love that. Maybe once, twice, three times, four times if we're really pushing. And they're not, they're never seeking after you. You have to pursue them so much that there's not really an opportunity to help because they haven't really invested anything. They're not wanting it. They haven't pursued it. So if you are falling into that confused category, please look around. We have so many seasoned believers in this room that would love to walk alongside of you. We call this a family for a reason. We want to be there for one another. Pick one another up when they're weak. Walk and speak the truth in love. Say, this is what Scripture says. You don't have to be confused about those difficult questions. God can handle your toughest questions. You can handle them. And I know I'm taking a long time just to recap the last two weeks, but it's that important. Okay? You need to get grace. You need to understand what God has done for you and saved you from. Romans 6.11 says this, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Consider that word there, that that means to reckon, to take into account, to weigh the reasons, to deliberate, to determine, to decide. You must deliberate, decide, consider, reckon, measure the reasons about you are dead to sin. You need to dwell on that. You need to understand it, soak it in, reckon it, weigh the reasons that you are dead to sin and now you've been made alive to God in Christ Jesus. You need to wrap your mind, to wrap your heart. It says to renew your mind. 
to the new truth that you have been made dead to sin and alive to Christ. Where you were dead in sin. You were dead in your sin. There was nothing you could do. Remember, that was your identity before salvation was dead. That was all you had. There was no ability that you had. But now what you did, you were raised to new life. Right? You rose victoriously with Jesus from the dead. You were dead. Jesus came back, conquered death. That has no hold over us anymore. We're victorious over it. So we are no longer dead. We have been made alive to God in Christ. We've been made alive to God in Christ because of what Jesus has done for us. Let me get into this here. When at the beginning of creation, I'm just going to go back to this just for a quick explanation. At the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Adam sinned, right? Sin entered the world through one man. In Romans 5 it says that Adam, he was a type of the one who was to come. Right? So a type or a shadow or a representation or a, a prefigure to Christ. Adam, through Adam, sin and death entered the world and reigns. In verse 18 it says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Adam brought sin and death. Jesus brought life and justification. We're justified now. The justice has been served, and we didn't have to serve it. We stand justified before a perfect, almighty God who cannot take any sin. Sin must have death. For the wage of sin, the payment you receive from sin is death. Romans 6.23. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Through Adam's sin and death came into the world. Through Jesus, it says that life and justification for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience... The many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. This, I'm, I'm recapping these first two weeks because we need to understand what we were. And we need to understand what Jesus did and then what we became. We were dead, right? Loud and clear. Jesus came, lived a perfect life. The Old Testament animals were sacrificed every time someone sinned. Consistently, there were sacrifices made that animals had to be killed for sin because the wage of sin is always death until Jesus came, lived the perfect life, and became the perfect ultimate sacrifice. His death paid the penalty for all sin, past, present, and future, from right now, future, future sins. Paid the penalty. Sin was buried with him. He rose to new life, victorious over death, victorious over sin, victorious over the devil, the demons, every enemy that could be formed against us is now defeated. Before that, Romans 5 tells us that we were still weak. While we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. That God showed his love for us while we were still sinners. And that while we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. While we were weak, while we were sinners, while we were his enemies... While we were dead in our sin, there is nothing we can do to get out of that on our own power. Jesus is the one that did it. Instead of being weak now, we are strong. Instead of being enemies of God, do you guys realize this? We're no longer enemies. We've been adopted into the family as sons and daughters of the king. Enemies get destruction. You get destroyed when your enemy is God. Sons and daughters get an inheritance. They're a part of the family. They're brought into the kingdom, brought into the house, brought in with brothers and sisters. It says that Jesus may be the firstborn among many brothers and many sisters. We're part of the family. We're, we were enemies. Now we're part of the family. We were dead, and we've been made alive. And guys, important, especially if you have that legalistic tendency, you were a sinner and you have been made righteous. That's what it says there. Remember in verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, all of us were made sinners, through one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. You have been made righteous. You've been made righteous. Two verses before that. Verse 17, for if because one man's trespass, death bringing many trespasses through justification, that's Adam's trespass, Sorry, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and 
the free gift of righteousness. The free gift of righteousness. I don't know how, when you think of a righteous man, what do you think of? Right? A humble man. He provides for his family. He loves his wife. He loves his children. He works hard. He has a good home. He has provided for the people around him. He's generous. Right? He's loving. He's patient with people. This is a righteous man who lives the right way. Right? He's, he's gentle with people. He's, he, he forgives people. He leads the way in behaving the right way. This is a righteous man. And it says that that righteousness, you're not behaving in it. It's gifted to you. 100%. You are now righteous. That's incredible. It's not by your behavior. You didn't behave in any of those ways. Jesus says, I'm giving you the gift of righteousness that now in God's eyes, he sees you the way that he sees Jesus. You are a son like Jesus is a son or a daughter. Same way. God sees you as a child of his, and you've been given a gift of righteousness. So what does that mean for your behavior? Did you do that? No. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. See, what we're talking about today, guys, is I wanted to, I rehashed it over and over and over and over and over again that the gift of grace, the gift of salvation was given to you. You were delivered. You were transferred. You were brought out of death and into life. It's all what God did for you. You were made alive to Christ. Alive, you were made alive, right? Right? You're alive right now, too, in the physical body. You're alive, right? Are you going to stay in that seat until you die? No? You're not going to stay right where you are right now for the rest of your life? Did God save you so you could spend the rest of your eternity in a spiritual lazy boy just chilling? Absolutely. He made you alive so you could live. He made you alive so you could walk, so you could present yourself. Your instruments or your body, your members, your money, your passions, your skills, the gifts he's given you, present those things to him as instruments that he can play, as weapons that he can use. Right? You were made to live, not just to be made alive. So we've been made alive. It's all for him. Now, how do we live? How do we cooperate with grace? It's a gift that's been given to us, but now we are still here. We didn't just get brought to heaven. Right? If we weren't made alive and then brought to heaven, that wasn't the life. That wasn't it. We were made alive and we are still here. Jesus says that you were meant to walk in a manner worthy of your call, right? Jesus didn't say that. Paul said that. Walk in a manner worthy of your call. Right? But Jesus did give us behavioral benchmarks. You look at the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, you see all these things that are behavioral. You need to live up to this style. This is what the kingdom looks like. This is what it looks like to be a son of the king. This is what it looks like to behave within the kingdom. He gives behavioral benchmarks. I'm going to get too far ahead of myself. Let me read you scripture. It'll keep me on point. Romans 8.8 8 says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, in each of your bodies right now, do you still have the flesh? Do you still have temptation to sin? Do you still choose selfishness? Do you still lose your temper? Is the flesh still alive inside of you? Absolutely. That's the part that's being still renewed. Right? So your spirit has been made alive, 100% forgiven, alive, working within the kingdom. Your brand new identity is here. Your body is being renewed. Some people call it sanctification. We renew our minds. Now, in the flesh, no man can do any good. There is no good that any man can do in the flesh. You still have the flesh, which means if you do good things in the flesh, they still aren't good. The Old Testament says that your good behavior, your good acts, are like Dirty menstrual rags. Your good behavior, your good acts, the good things that you do in the flesh, still not great. It's pretty ugly, pretty, pretty gross. Right? So I don't, I, if I'm doing good behavior in my flesh, if they're good things, I'm not saved or saved. If I'm doing good things that I think of, that I consider good, I'm, my measurement is before man. My manly measurement of what is good is before you guys. This is where the Pharisees fell into. You wash the outside of the cup, but you don't. You ignore the inside. You do all your good works before people to be seen by people. 
but you don't, you don't worry about what God thinks of you. You slam the kingdom of heaven in people's face. I don't want to fall into that. No way. So if, if your good works in the flesh are gross, what does that mean we need to do? Live in the spirit. scripture. Keep the scripture. Romans 12, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. You See, it says right here that we need to be Presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. My passions, my skills, my ability to communicate is completely given to God, right? Any, any skill that he's given me, it is now an instrument for him to be used. And it says that you must test. You must renew your mind, right? So when I say, I'm going to preach a good sermon today because I want people to think I'm a good preacher, no, 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 no. That thought will crawl me to my mind. Natural. Natural. I want to be seen as a good preacher. I want to be seen as a good leader of the people. I want to be seen as somebody that's worth coming and listening to. I ha that is not true. I have to renew my mind right there. See? Natural instinct is telling me I want to be seen by you guys as somebody that's important, somebody that's got something to say, somebody that's worth listening to. Those are the ways all my temptation and my flesh is going to draw me. And I have to say, no, no, no. God, honestly, if you want to make me look like an idiot up there for your glory, praise God. Right? It's happened before. <laughs> honestly. Honestly, it has. God, whatever you want to say, I submit it to you. If you want to rewrite anything that I had written down, feel free to do it. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say, this is all yours, God. Do what you are going to do. Anything that comes from me, make it fall short, make it die before it hits people's ears. But anything from you, I pray that it takes seed in their heart and grows to real spiritual life. It says we must test it, we must learn, we must renew our minds to say, God, I'm submitting this to you. I submit everything to you. I'm going to test and learn to discern the voice of God. That's why we say our top priority here, our number one core value, really the whole vision for the church, is to create a culture that values intimacy with God above everything else. Because if you spend time intimate and alone with God every single day like Jesus calls us to do, you will begin to hear his voice. You begin to learn to hear what he sounds like. You will begin to recognize him in the hustle and bustle of your day to see where he is moving and see what he is doing. Naturally, when you consistently submit yourself to the Holy Spirit that lives within you, you will start to pour out fruits of the Spirit, the everlasting, eternal good works that actually matter. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I would, just, just for self-control, I'd be pumped to go after it. If I could learn to control myself in every circumstance, we'd be set. Just that one thing, to have that pour out of me, praise God. I want all of them, though. And to do that, it says present yourself, present your lives, present your members, present all of the things that you have available to you to God. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you now. And you did nothing to get that. Really, all your good behavior that you can even try to do is just going to make it look ugly. Don't try so hard. Don't fill your day up with a busy schedule every single day. Don't wake up five minutes before you have to be somewhere. That's personally convicting. <laughs> make time for God. Set time aside to say the most important thing every single day, including today, right now, is to hear from you, to spend time with you, to listen in and to submit myself wholeheartedly to you. We've said before, even if it's just that first 10 seconds where you lace up your shoes, say, God, my day is submitted to you. I love you. I trust you. You are my leader. I don't want to get in the way. Start there. Build into it. You don't need to graduate from today to be an hour-long devotional every single day on the weekends. It's three hours. You don't need to graduate into that first day. Remember, it's messy. When you first convert all the lifestyle habits you had, don't just go away. The flesh is still there. Don't be too hard on yourselves. But don't exist in such a way that you're abusing the freedom you've been gifted with. 
Christ has set you free for freedom's sake. He wants you to be free. He says, my load is light. My burden is easy. Come to me if you're tired. Come to me if you feel lost. Come to me if you're hungry. Come to me if you're thirsty. I'll satisfy you. People have so many spiritual questions. People say, I believe in God, but I don't know if I want to buy into the whole Christianity thing to believe in Jesus and that the Holy Spirit, and when people are worshiping, putting their hands in the air, it gets weird. Right? It's, it makes me uncomfortable. The different things that church brings with it, I don't, I don't feel real comfortable in those atmospheres. But guys, if we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit, he was sent to be our comforter. That's one of his things. He's our teacher. He's our comforter. Jesus says, I'm sending one to you, and he will be your comforter. If you never leave your comfort zone, you have no need of the Holy Spirit. If you always exist in where you're comfortable, the Holy Spirit will never be alive in your life. If you always exist in the safe space that a lot of churches allow you to exist in, you'll never step out and say, this is, this is weird, I'm going to pray for your foot because you got a cast on, I'm sorry, I'm doing it though. Can I lay hands on you please? Thank you. God, please heal it. Nothing happens. That was uncomfortable. Luckily you have the Holy Spirit to comfort you. Right? Or they get healed. That was worth it. They're not going to be too pissed at you because you healed them. They're not going to be too offended. They're not going to be too like, ah, oh, this guy's weird. No, you got, he got healed. It's okay to step out. We want to be led by the Spirit. And again, you don't got to graduate to varsity level Christianity first day. It's just saying don't be half-hearted. Don't be lukewarm. Don't let yourself fall into legalism to say I'm going to do everything the right way and I'm going to earn this. The Bible tells us if we could earn it, Christ died in vain. He never needed to die. If we can earn it, if we can behave a certain way, if you can look at, like, there's no way that this person that I love that was so good can't be in heaven. They have to be in heaven. The best works of those people, as much as it hurts, isn't enough. That sucks, but that's just what the Bible is telling us. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. We need God. Without it, it's hell. That's heartbreaking to me in so many ways, but I'm not going to be a lukewarm, half-hearted Christian that doesn't reveal that to people. I have the best news in the world. I'm going to share it with you because it's not hard. Yeah, it might seem weird. The best news is you don't have to do anything. God loves you. God will deliver you. God will transfer you. God will conquer everything for you. And the, you're made alive. You'll get that. You'll experience it. Don't stay in the mud puddle. Walk out of it and go and embrace what God has created you for. And when you do, the love that you seek after in relationships or from parents or from children will not be what you need to be satisfied in love, God provides the perfect thing. Joy and peace doesn't come from money and stuff. Those things leave you hollow and empty. It's playing in the mud puddle. It's staying under the bridge. Joy and peace come from God despite circumstances. No matter what you're going through, no matter how terrible it is, love, joy, peace, they flow in and they flow out. You become too powerful of a person for someone else's behavior to dictate your love. Your negativity, your hate, your evil desires don't affect my love that can come out of me. Your behavior can't change mine. I'm too powerful. I'm too strong in the Lord. I have the Holy Spirit, a gift. He is my comforter. He is my teacher. Guys, don't be satisfied. Don't be satisfied with what the world has to offer. Don't be satisfied with what church or good behavior might look like and have to offer you. Seriously. Renew the mind, repent of old behavior, and say, I'm going to cut anything off for the sake of God. Because, guys, he's so worth it. He's worthy of your affection. He's worthy of your time. He's worthy of the any amount of attention you can give to him. And the more you put into it, the more he comes right back. Really. You can't out-love God. You can't go after him too much or too hard or too aggressively, too zealously. A man or a woman, they are as holy as they want to be. You can't exhaust the depths of the goodness of God. Can you? You got anybody that's experienced the exhaustion of his goodness? No. It goes deeper and deeper. We're talking about the creator of the universe who wants to have an intimate personal relationship with you. And he's going to take care of all the heavy lifting to get to that point. So guys, if you have fallen into those temptations, if you've fallen into the wrong responses to grace, if you've never wholeheartedly committed yourself to your creator, and if you've never wholeheartedly committed yourself to live according to your created purpose, do it today. Don't waste any more time. As good as a mud puddle might seem, 
There's really, it's wretched, it's miserable, you're blind and naked. Take the gold that God has to offer you. Take the family that He's offering you. Get someone to walk alongside you, brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers in the faith, to disciple you. We have a good thing. And no matter how far gone you are, no matter how bad you've been hurt or how badly you've sinned, someone here has sinned worse, honestly, probably. That's the crowd we've kind of created. No one's going to be surprised by your sin here. And when you can present your sin up, we can say, okay, that's the sin, let's take it off the table. What brought you there? What's going on inside of you? What's been misrepresented? How do you see God incorrectly that is allowing you to choose that sin over what God has to offer? That's what we want to get after. I'm not afraid of your sin. We're not going to bring up sin. Oh, this is how you did wrong. This is what you did incorrectly. This is all the wrong stuff you continue to do. No, why do you continue to do it? Sin has no power. We are victorious over it. Let's get to your heart. Let's identify where's, where's God being misrepresented in your soul. Let's dig into it. Let's be a family. Let's speak the truth in love so that we no longer have to be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but that we can grow into maturity so that we can make disciples that go on and make more disciples. Guys, all of us created independently, individually, personalities, experiences, all those things make every single individual in here different. I don't represent the whole church of kingdom life. I'm one very small piece of it, but together we do make up the body that is kingdom life. Right? So we want you to participate. You were made alive to live. You were made alive to walk. You were made alive to exist outside of that chair. And before you get to heaven, there's a lot of life to live. Live it for your created purpose. Worship team, why don't you guys come up and close us out? But guys, with this last little bit right here, all right, we got a family meal. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be tasty. I saw some of the things come in, people calling like four or five boxes, some of them. I know there's food out there. Before we get to that, good things, hanging out with the family. But before we get to that, I want you to take a hard look at your heart. Take a sincere look at what's going on inside of you. What have you bought into that is a misrepresentation of our faith? Do you feel too dirty to turn to God? Do you feel like I have to go clean myself up before I can come back and be with God? Have you existed in a place that this is just a lukewarm faith, a half-hearted faith? I've never bought fully into this. I've never presented my body as a living sacrifice for him to work through. You've never experienced the supernatural presence of your creator. If you're confused, you don't have someone to pour into you, come up and ask. I will help you find someone. Make it happen now. We have a ministry team. We worship because we believe God's presence is going to fill this space and we want to minister to you. So ministry team, come on up. I'm going to pray for you guys. God, thank you for being so good to us. Thank you, God, that we can never exhaust your goodness. Thank you, God, that you have are, you are deep, deep, deep waters and we can never get to the bottom, God. Father, thank you that for those who ask, those who seek, those who knock, you respond. God, I ask that the questions that are holding people back, that God, you would give answers and have them bring them up. God, I pray that if there is some behavioral element that's holding them back from fully embracing what you have for them, I pray that they would cut it loose. God, I pray that this morning would be a morning for repentance, for recommitment, God, for a zealous pursuit to be in love with you. Thank you for doing all the hard work. Thank you that you delivered us. Thank you that you transferred us. Thank you that you qualified us. And thank you for making us alive so that we can live, walk, and be ambassadors in your kingdom to represent your love to everybody. God, teach us, train us, help us to hear your voice more often. And God, to understand the way you nudge and push more delicately. Help us to be aware of your movements. We trust you. Thank you for being so faithful. God, that over and over and over again, there's not a